Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for coming and thanks to uh, Strelka for having me. I uh, wanted to start with that so that it would uh, set the tone uh, quite nicely for my talk. This is pretty much state of the art in this so-called field of AI right now. Um, I made this just a few days ago using um, this an algorithm that Google released, or actually an intern at Google released just a few weeks ago called BigGAN. And if you're not familiar with any of these terms, don't worry, you don't need to be. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about it. But I just want to say just from the outset that um, I'm not really going to talk about smart cities or even cities at all. I don't really know a lot about cities um, until recently. This is where I've been living uh, at the end of this valley. Um, that little village, which maybe you can see, is not even where I was, but outside of that village. And this was my most regular neighbor, Kelly, Kelly the Kestrel, who would visit the garden every day. Um, and this was my studio and my studio manager. So, of course, if you think of cities as the kind of vast global infrastructure and virtual networks that support our contemporary lifestyles, then of course, yes, I'm still part of the city. But um, from a traditional definition, I'm not really part of that world. So the reason that I am here is uh, because I work, I'm an artist that works with emerging technologies and I'm particularly for the past four or five years been working in this field called AI. I'm doing a PhD in, in it actually and I'll specifically deep learning and expressive human machine interaction. I'm going to talk about that a bit as well. But I'd like to first give a bit of context um, as to where I come from. So this is a, a selection of work going back about 15 years and I'm a computational artist so I use computation as, as a medium and to express ideas and thoughts and feelings and generally these are ideas around emerging technologies as extensions of the human mind, as extensions of the human body its impact on us as individuals, its impact on us, um, on, on how we behave and how we express ourselves, and the broader impact on society and culture, ethics, law, tradition, and religion. And what I do from a practical point of view, is what, I, what my craft is, so to speak, is I write software. <clears throat> I code, that, that's the medium that I really work in. So everything you're seeing is driven by custom software for that particular project. And some of the work that you're seeing now is experiments in augmenting reality. Not augmented reality like you know, Pokemon Go with on your phone, but actually augmenting reality. Um, and another angle, which was in the first half of the video, is devising systems which we can interact with in a real-time manner with continuous control. Uh, that may sound a bit more complicated than it actually is. I just mean something like a piano, where you take an action, you make a sound, you hear the sound you make, your body responds, and you do something else. Um, so Photoshop is not an example of, of this, because I feel it lacks that immediacy. So a lot of this work is all computational, it's all algorithmic. I could argue that it's AI, but I'm not going to. But really, there's no um, machine learning, and that's really the, going to be the subject of my talk, because I've, for the past four or five years, been doing a lot of work with machine learning, um, particularly deep learning. In fact, this is this project right now. This one does use machine learning. Here, all the lights. I've kind of been trained to. Um, respond somehow to the, to the dancers' movements. But this was just the intro. So I'm here to give a few alternative perspectives on this thing that we call AI. And the kind of full title of my talk is Machines that learn, what do they know? Do they know things? Let's find out. But more specifically, it's what can we learn from machines that learn? Uh, before this, I need to get a few things out of the way, uh, a few kind of lay down some terminology. 
so that we're all on the same page because when we say AI, this is what the internet thinks AI looks like. Um, it's blue and shiny. So I avoid the term AI as much as possible because there's too much ambiguity um, and it unpacks differently in people's minds. So I talk about machine learning. That's the kind of dominant paradigm today and it's the field that I work in. And the basic idea is, let's assume that there's this system, there's a function f, you feed it some input x and it outputs an output y. In traditional programming, we would write the function f. We would sit down and think, what should this function do? And we would design f and we would write it. With machine learning, you don't write f. You write a learning algorithm and then you give it example data. You give it examples. This x should be this y. And the algorithm, the learning algorithm, figures out what f should be. And f can be very, very, very complex. Um, so this is about as much maths I'm going to talk about. I'm going to now switch to a bit of history because why am I so interested in this? Um, so I should mention that this can also be more broadly considered data-driven methods, which I'll get to as well. So we go back to the 1800s, Charles Babbage. He designed a bunch of these mechanical computers. Um, and we know about these through the writings of his collaborator, Lady Ada Lovelace, which some of you might know as you know, the world's first computer programmer. But in her notebooks, she wrote notes with comments with incredible foresight. She wrote, the analytical engine, the name of that computer, weaves algebraic patterns just as the jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. And one of her most profound insights was she saw the potential of this machine to go beyond just calculating equations, to operate on symbols, to do true general purpose computing. And she went on to say, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent, she said in 1843, in a way foreshadowing the generative art movement that was to come over a century later. But she also said this very controversial statement. The analytical engine has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. It can follow analysis, but it has no power of anticipating any analytical revelations or truths. Its province is to assist us in making what we are already acquainted with. And for two centuries since then, we've been arguing about whether she's right or wrong about whether a machine can originate anything. And given the state of the technology and knowledge in the 1800s, I agree with Lovelace. However, something happened between Lovelace and today, and that is World War I and World War II, which pushed first mechanical computers and then digital computers. And eventually we come to Turing, who in his 1950 seminal essay, Computer and Machine Intelligence, he addresses this statement. And he opens his essay with, can machines think? Again, we're still arguing about this 70 years later. He refers to Lovelace's argument as Lady Lovelace's objection. And he proposes, in order to be considered to originate anything, a machine should be able to surprise people, even its programmer. And he adds, machines take me by, great, by surprise by great frequency because two years prior, he had theorized something that neither Babbage nor Lovelace could have contemplated, and that is machines that can learn, machines that can program themselves. And he called these things unorganized machines, loosely inspired by the brain. And he went on to propose, instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulates the child's? If this were then subjected to an appropriate course of education, we would obtain the adult's brain. And he adds, an important feature of a learning machine is that its teacher will often be very largely ignorant of what's happening inside. So this is all happening in 1950. Um, so he's basically foreshadowing where we are right now. And what he just said here is simultaneously the most interesting and exciting and potentially most dangerous aspect of machine learning. Because what machine learning actually is, it's the science of 
extracting and distilling meaningful information from data. So any development in machine learning will impact any field which is data-oriented. And we live in times where every field is data-oriented, physics, chemistry, biology, psychology, sociology, genetics, neuroscience, economy, politics, cities. So machine learning will make us see things that we otherwise wouldn't be able to see. And once we see some of these things, we will not be the same, the same way when Galileo looked to the heavens and he confirmed what Copernicus and Kepler had theorized. We could not be the same after that. And what we might discover through machine learning may be amazing, it may not be that amazing. Already today, we have a lot of issues around algorithmic, data-driven, critical decision-making systems, particularly when they're closed source, closed data, for profit. That's a recipe for disaster. But there are bigger disasters that could happen. Um, a very hot topic in the news right now, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. It's basically a search and replace for DNA. But the problem is we don't actually know what sequences of DNA do what. And this is right now a big machine learning problem. How to crack this so-called problem of genotype to phenotype mapping, how sequences of DNA map to sequences or to physical characteristics. And it might be that if we do ever crack this, it will be with machine learning, and maybe through this we'll be able to cure leukemia, we might be able to cure Alzheimer's, or it might be that the super rich are able to boost the IQ of their babies to 300, um, literally splitting the species apart. So these are the kind of things that I'm kind of more worried about than the singularity or robots taking over. But again, on the other hand, it's because of these kind of systems that we've managed to identify a tiny perturbation at 126 giga electron volts amongst petabytes of data to confirm the Higgs boson or to isolate a chirp lasting a fraction of a second amongst years of deafening background noise to find the remnants of the gravitational waves emitted from two black holes colliding a billion years ago. So that's machine learning. There's a subfield of machine learning, just the last piece of terminology, which is deep learning, which is the major kind of big paradigm right now, which is what I work in as well. And this is basically, it's a form of machine learning. We're talking about huge um, neural networks, artificial neural networks, very loosely inspired by, but really nothing like the brain at all. It's comical to even compare. And what sets these particular deep learning algorithms apart is they specialize in one thing, and that is on operating on vast amounts of data, on vast amounts of raw data, so on, on pixels, on, on raw audio files, hours and hours, of hundreds of hours of audio. And when you pipe data through this network, it is literally a journey through multiple dimensions and transformations in space and time. Because each block that you see here is a nonlinear, high dimensional transformation, learning and extracting unique features from the previous block to learn and build a hierarchy of increasingly abstract representations. And amidst the depths of these representations is the great unknown. Some of you might be familiar with this aesthetic. It's an algorithm called Deep Dream, which was hugely um, viral in 2015. Um, now, I really, really love this algorithm. Not the aesthetic. The, the, this aesthetic is the algorithm's aesthetic. I love the poetry of what's happening. Without going into too much detail, this algorithm has, well, the net, it's a network that's been trained to classify images, to recognize images. And when it's presented with something it doesn't recognize, like me, we run the network backwards to generate an image of what it thinks it's seeing. Basically, what, what it knows. So it's producing these abstract images with features of what it knows. It's a bit like we look at a cloud, we see a rabbit, we see a face, and then we draw it. So that metaphor already is interesting, but what I really like about what's happening here is this 
algorithm thinks it sees bits of birds' feet or dogs' faces in different bits of my body, and it amplifies those. And then we look at these images and we say, oh, it's a puppy slug, it's a bird lizard. But there are no such things as bird lizards or puppy slugs. What's happening is our mind is also desperately trying to understand what it's seeing through the lens of what it already knows. We are literally, not on an implementation level, but on a conceptual level, doing the same thing. We are looking at a mirror here. So this is an aspect of machine learning that I'm really interested in exploring, looking at ways of using these algorithms to reflect on how we make sense of the world, using machine bias to reflect on our own self-affirming cognitive biases, and think about how we project meaning. Because ultimately, this is what goes into the trained network. It's just white noise, complete randomness. And the neural network takes this on a journey. Oh. So, um, yeah, we needn't worry about the machine uprising because it just crashed. Sorry. Yeah, it's open source software. Um, Where was I? Yeah. So this is what goes into the train network, and the goes on a journey through multiple dimensions and transformations in space and time. And this is what comes out. It's structured noise with a particular distribution. And we are machines that yearn for structure. We project meaning onto them, because that's what we do. It's what we've always done. That's how we survive in the wild, how we relate to each other. We invent stories, we make stuff up, we believe in them, we look for regularities. And everything that we see or read or hear, even these sentences that I'm saying right now, you're trying to make sense of through everything that you've ever read and heard and known and filtered through your prior beliefs and knowledge. So some of the different perspectives I'm going to talk about, I can group under two headings, or rather like a spectrum, and that's fascination and frustration. And maybe frustration is a bit of an understatement here, but I'll stick with it because of the alliteration. So, like I mentioned, AI or machine learning as, um, as a way to reflect on ourselves. What does it mean to learn? What does it mean to understand from both computational perspectives, but also from a human perspective? and ultimately using machine learning as a reflection on how we make sense of the world and how we project meaning onto the world. And from there, we can't not encounter bias, whether it's machine bias or self-affirming human cognitive bias. And from there, the under, my underlying motivation from here is really about what seems to me the increasing amount of political and social polarization in my home country of Turkey, in England, where I've been living, and, and worldwide. So in a last desperate attempt, I'll talk about kind of computational perspectives on morality and ethics, particularly using computation as a language, as a supplemental language to natural language. And then there's my PhD, which has the catchy title real-time interactive multimodal media synthesis and continuous control using generative deep neural networks for creative expression and human machine artistic co-creation so this is about half the phd right here i'm still working on the title um, i'll get to that as well a few themes which i'm not going to go into detail so i'm just going to go through it super quickly now is Looking at the emergence, or rather the explosion of AI that's happening right now, after a phase of steady growth in big data, and how this should come as no surprise, that it's almost an uh, inevitable consequence, and looking at this from a few different perspectives, one is that I like to think of consciousness is evolution's solution to dealing with big data. The metaphor relating the emergence of AI as a means of coping with big data, analogous to the Darwinian evolution of intelligence in biology, especially when vision evolved about 540 million years ago, um, and simple organisms needed to start needing more complex processing systems to make use, more optimal use, of the limited neural bandwidth 
um, with this higher rich sensory data coming in so that they could avoid predators or catch prey. And this, as some believe, gave rise to the Cambrian explosion. And other organisms even started learning to model the environment so that they could make better predictions and be more efficient. And to be able to form any kind of social interaction, for me to be able to interact with you, not as billions of cells or um, particles vibrating on a quantum field, but as a thinking, feeling individual whereby your consciousness is an abstracted high-level entity with goals and desires that I can empathize with. It, it's my interface to you. But there's another perspective of why we have AI as a rise of big data. Because like I mentioned, the revolution in we having an AI is in deep learning, which is the field of training on vast, vast, vast amounts of data. And it's no coincidence that the biggest funders and advocates of AI research are the ones whose business model depends on making sense and understanding big data. Likewise, with the GCHQ, the NSA, they've got more data than they know what to do with. So they're investing heavily because they need algorithms to produce executive summaries of everything that they're collecting. So this is why the bulk of the research that we have is totally surveillance related. And any offshoots, like the work that I'm doing, a lot of the other people are doing that are not surveillance related, they are still pretty much rooted in surveillance related technologies. So I think it's safe to say that if World War I gave us analog computers and World War II gave us digital computers and the Cold War gave us the internet, that the mass surveillance of the war on terror and the data-driven psychographic advertising is giving us deep learning and AI. Um, another perspective I really like uh, comes with a nice transition from the pioneering nurse and statistician Florence Nightingale, um, bearing in mind that deep learning is basically um, computational statistics. She said, to understand God's thoughts, we must study statistics, for these are the measure of his purpose. And there are fascinating perspectives on the current rise of AI and mass surveillance through the lens of the ultimate panopticon, that is religion, the all-seeing eye of God. Of the thousands of deities and beliefs and overseers that humanity has had, the overseers have always co-evolved to match the needs of the host society. And now, as we're losing our spiritual sensibilities and drowning ourselves in materialism and technological submission, our overseer too is adapting and co-evolving, living up in the cloud of all places, watching over us and listening to our thoughts and dreams in ones and zeros. We killed God, as Nietzsche says, but we are rebuilding him with technology to match our techno culture. We are creating a digital God for a digital culture. But it doesn't even end there. This new overseer in the cloud not only watches us to protect us uh, and punish the bad, but now as it learns and becomes more intelligent, it, becomes, it makes decisions for us. We've been offloading our memory to external devices for tens of thousands of years etchings in stone, pieces of paper, personal computers, etc. But it used to be that we owned these devices or they were physically somewhere we could locate. But now we no longer do this offline thinking and um, the offloaded thinking on our own devices. We do it in the cloud. We use these so-called APIs and we use these little um, portals to communicate with this uh, so-called cloud using, for example, this new language of the scripture, which some of you might recognize as JSON. So a few years ago, I wrote a poem, a collaboration with Google. Not people working at Google, but actual Google. So it, it's a poem. Uh, we have a very intimate connection with the cloud. We confide in it, we confess to it, we appeal to it, we share secrets with it that we wouldn't share with our closest friends. And Google is the uh, keeper of our collective consciousness. It sees everything we see, it knows everything we know, it feels everything we feel. So this poem is actually more a collection of prayers. Uh, that, that's how I, I think of it. So this was in 2014. Um, as you saw, I type a few words and Google autocompletes. And based on what the world is feeling, these are the actual words of billions of people around the world and their prayers as archived in the cloud. So I realized a few years ago that all of my work was about waves or God. And I'm not going to just talk about God, don't worry. Um, 
but usually somehow about both. And more bro broadly speaking, what I mean by this is the intersections of science and spirituality, or rather a holistic view on science and spirituality, and particularly the collisions between nature and science and technology and ethics and ritual, tradition and religion. And when I use the term waves, what I really mean are the patterns in nature which humans have managed within our limited cognitive abilities to recognize, decipher, and formalize into equations. And that often somehow we find elegant and beautiful. And when I use the term God, it represents those mysterious aspects of nature which we have yet to understand and the lengths we will go to and try to make sense of it all. And when I use the term quantum mechanics, what I am, rep that to me represents the fringes of human knowledge, where we empirically know what is a accurate model, and we can understand through the language of maths, but we have no real intuitive comprehension of what it means. This is one kind of waves, obviously, oceanic waves. I grew up by the sea in Istanbul. I'm obsessed with the sea. Um, I can and have spent all day sitting on the shore watching the ocean, and I don't know why. That in itself is quite fascinating. But I'm interested in other types of waves, which I think my computer is not happy for me to show because it's just crashed again. Okay. No worries, it's just, um, okay, it's actually frozen. Okay. So um, luckily, a lot of AI research is being done on Linux, and everything's open source. So it's likely it will crash uh, quite often, so we don't have to worry about robots just yet. Oh, yeah. So, uh, other types of waves. This is a series of work that I started in 2011. Um, it's an exploration of simple oscillations and particularly the emergence of complex patterns and rhythms through the interaction of simple oscillatory behavior. Um, and really, in a nutshell, complexity from simplicity, which we can think of as like the essence of, of nature, of evolution, etc. So it takes the many different forms, um, installations of various sizes, um, many different incarnations, quite large-scale versions, a live performance with 16 drummers, very kind of Steve Reich, Terry Riley inspired. But I want to talk about one particular version, a very simple version. So the reason I want to show this is when you look at this, you might see a lot of moving parts and it might seem quite complicated. But actually, it's incredibly, incredibly simple. Uh, there's one really simple rule. A lot of these kind of agents, or maybe that might be a misleading term, these objects are moving up and down with a fixed frequency, but they all have different frequencies. It doesn't change. Nothing changes with time. Um, wind the system up, let it go, and it's this ever-evolving, um, quite complex patterns. So this complexity emerges from this simplicity. But what I find fascinating is, as you watch this, you might, you're probably trying to understand what the patterns are, and you're maybe extracting some kind of structure. But it's quite possible that the rules that you extract from watching this, when you simplify this, it might not be the simple rules that I put in. So we have complexity emerging from simplicity, and then our mind comes into the picture and tries to reduce it again. And in reducing it, it might discover not the original simplicity, but a higher level emergent simplicity. And I find that fascinating. This was a version that I did um, with a palace. I was quite lucky to do it with lights. And here, 
the image that you're seeing on the top is the view when you're in the middle looking up at the sky. So it's literally projecting this back onto the cloud where God lives, allegedly. But um, so the next piece I want to talk about is that was 2011. This is 2009. It's earlier. And this is the other end of the spectrum in the sense that this is very complicated. Uh, the previous one was super simple. I wrote it in like, you know, like five minutes. This one, uh, there's a camera, it's taking footage of a dancer, that's going into the computer. It's quite complicated algorithms going on to convert the video feed of the dancer into um, vector fields and find motion, and then there's a fluid simulation, and it's affecting the fluid simulation. So there's a ton of stuff going on. But when you look at it, you're not thinking of calculus, you just know what's happening. It's a person dancing, and it's covered in like smoke and fire and stuff. So your ability to detect that amongst all of this noise is quite incredible. Like this is a really hard problem for computers right now to be able to detect where is this person? You know, is this even a person and what is this person doing? So, and particularly if I were to pause this video and you look at this, you might not have any idea what this is. Now, you know it's a person, so now you might be able to tell, but you might not know where the head is, where the arms are, where the legs are. But if I play it through movement, you're able to track this. And even once you've locked onto an arm or a leg, once it, even if it goes to a very abstract phase like it is now, you can in your mind simulate and play forward what it would be doing. So you can imagine where the leg might be so that when it comes back out, you've just predicted. So that's um, also something I find quite fascinating in how we the way we make sense of the world is not just by trying to understand the structure, but through prediction. So it, it's a very time-based uh, phenomena. Um, another project that links on from here is Equilibrium, which I made, it's a touch and installation I made in 2014. Um, it was initially inspired by ecosystems. In fact, with a trip to Madagascar with, maybe some of you know, the Unknown Fields Division with Liam Young and Kate Davies. So this was initially inspired by ecosystems. Um, hanging in a delicate balance with loads of forces acting upon it. Here, there's literally millions of dynamic objects. Um, each pixel is physically simulated. And it looks like a static image, but actually they're oscillating like crazy. And when you touch it, you upset this balance and the system falls out of equilibrium and it falls into this unstable condition. But then if you stop disturbing it, if you're lucky, it will find a new configuration where it will settle in a new equilibrium, uh, kind of. So it's not static, it's still oscillating widely, but on a macro scale, it's in homeostasis. And so this is, of course, analogous to, you know, economy, finance, uh, ecosystems, like I said, populations, um, many social trends, biological systems, many things. But it's also thought to be a kind of foundation of how the brain works in the sense that the brain is a complex dynamical system with around 100 million neurons each with thousands of synapses firing like crazy and creating these feedback loops. And most of the time, it's stable. It doesn't go out of control. I mean, it does, and that's what we call, you know, having a, and like an epileptic fit is when that firing gets out of control. But most of the time, it's finds equilibrium. And some even believe that the goal of the brain, amongst many other things, but it's trying to stay at a point of equilibrium. I know everything that's coming from the outside or even from within upsets this balance. And the act of trying to find a new configuration of equilibrium is the act of learning or cognition, some believe. This is uh, from last year. I call this learning to see, hello world. This is a neural network that's literally opening its eyes for the very first time in that it hasn't been trained on anything. Um, it's just completely uninitialized and it's training live on the camera input webcam. And what that means is what it's trying to do is it's trying to find structure in the image that's coming now in relation to everything that it's seen before. How can it most optimally represent the information coming now in a way that in the future, when new signals come in, it can still optimally represent that without having to find these new points of equilibrium.
And this is a pre-trained neural network. This is making predictions on live camera inputs. And this particular piece combines quite a lot of the motivations that I've been talking about so far, because it has the practical angle now as well, which I was talking about with my PhD, which is using machine learning using machine learning to create systems that we can use to creatively express ourselves in a real-time, interactive manner with continuous control. Analogous to a musical instrument, where there's that immediate feedback loop between your actions, the system's response, you perceiving the results of your actions, and then responding. Um, the idea being that, actually, I like the way that this also ties in with the action the embodied action perception loop, with the idea being that perception is not a passive process. Our eyes aren't like cameras where light falls on them and we take a photo, but we have to scan the scene. Our eyes are constantly circading and scanning and the brain is integrating the knowledge of the movement information that is sent to the eye combined with the stream of information that's coming, combined with everything that it already thinks it knows about the scene, so that it can construct this mental model. So that ability to act is essential for perception and it's essential for embodiment. And has it crashed again? Yes, it has. This is a bit frustrating, but cats should not give in to the machine. Where were we? At least it hasn't frozen the whole system. Yeah, there we go. So that's one angle. This is the PhD angle, the kind of technical angle. But my kind of other preferred angle is this is a neural network. And some of you might have heard of something called style transfer, where you can take a photograph um, and a painting, like something by Monet, and you can apply the style of that painting to the photograph. Um, which is also using deep learning. This is not that. This is a neural network that's been trained on tens of thousands of photographs that I scraped, I uh, downloaded from the internet. So hopefully, this neural network knows something about waves. And actually it does, like it creates foam in a kind of correct way. It knows where it should put foam. Um, and what I like about this project on a kind of higher conceptual level is, so this neural network has been trained on tens of thousands of images, and now it's looking at my desk, and it's seen nothing but waves or clouds or fires, etc. And it's trying to make sense of what it's seeing. It's trying to reconstruct that image through what it knows, but it can only see what it already knows, just like us. Oh, I should say that those, this and the previous piece are currently on at the Moscow Museum of Modern Art. So this links on quite nicely to this next project, which is actually not about AI at all. It's kind of more about pure perception and cognition and human bias and subjective experience. It uses virtual reality as a technology, but I think it's about as non-VR as one could use that technology at. Um, ultimately, it's about empathy, but not VR being the empathy machine, but more actually the impossibility of empathy. Uh, I've mentioned some of these motivations, but I'll just summarize them again. There's a few motivations here. One, what we perceive to be real, what we see is a reconstruction in our minds. It's a simplified model of the world, limited by our biology and physiology. Perception, including vision, is an active process. It requires action and integration. Three, the actions that we take affect the reality and the meaning that we construct in our mind. And most importantly, even when presented with the same information, the exact same images, everybody will experience, they will see something unique and personal, which nobody else can see or even understand. And I'm interested in these ideas at a low level regarding our senses, for example, vision, but Really, I'm interested in these as metaphors for higher level um, situations where what we consider to be truth or 
an obvious meaning, our biases, our prejudices, and how we interact with each other based on those assumptions, and how this might affect, like I mentioned, the social and political polarization that we're having today. So since the days of the ancient Greeks, it was believed that we sh the way seeing happened was that we shot rays out of our eyes, and those rays hit objects in the world, and that's how we saw. In fact, even someone as smart as Plato believed that the eye contained fire, such that such fire has the property not of burning, but of yielding a gentle light. It strikes upon any object it encounters outside, and it passes on the motions of anything it comes in contact with throughout the whole body to the soul, and thus creates the sensation that we call seeing. Euclid, Ptolemy, and many other great thinkers for centuries believed in this, what they call the extremission theory of vision. And it's, it's quite poetic and beautiful, actually, because it's wrong. Um, even back then, Aristotle, Ibn al-Haytam, and many others believed in an intromission theory of vision, that our eyes don't emit light, but light bounces off objects, falls into the eye, and that's how we see. But what I like about the extramission theory is it underlines one angle of vision that we often forget, that seeing is an active process. You have to take action to perceive vision. So this metaphor of eyes like cameras, okay, it's maybe right when it comes to like lenses and stuff or similar, but we don't have a picture fall on the retina that gets sent to the brain. Instead, the part that's actually high resolution and color is the fovea has a two degree field of view about the size of my thumbnail at arm's length. So all of this stuff here is low resolution and mostly black and white. But to me, I can see this full crystal clear, full resolution, full color image because my eyes are constantly scanning the world. This doing saccades two or three times a second. And two or three times a second, it fixates at a point where it quickly adjusts exposure and focus, and then the brain integrates the eye movement, because the brain sent that information, with what it's seeing right now, with everything it saw before, and stitches together this picture in my brain. And we know this, actually, from a Russian scientist, Alfred Yarbus, who did a lot of research in the 50s and 60s, very, very seminal research. Um, he even found that if you show people a scene, for example, um, he famously used Unexpected Visitor by Ilya Repin here, and you ask people a question, like, what are these people doing? What are they talking about? How old are they? How long ago was, how long was this person out of the room? It affects the way that people unconsciously scan the room. So we're continually unconsciously scanning the world with our eyes. And a lot of that information doesn't make it to our conscious awareness. It just stays in there somewhere. We're not even aware of it. So there's a very extreme phenomenon called binocular rivalry that demonstrates a lot of these fascinating issues. And the idea is, under normal circumstances, stereo vision happens where the two eyes see the same scene from slightly different perspectives, and the brain integrates that to create a single cohesive percept of a 3D environment in the brain. But if you give what's known as dissimilar monocular images, as in two images which are very different, the brain is unable to integrate these. It's unable to stitch it together. So it enters an unstable stage, and the two images fight for attention in your brain. You don't see a blend of the two. You see one, and then it flips to the other, and then it flips back to the other. And that's at foveal vision. In peripheral vision, you get these swipes. Even if the images are static, what you consciously experience is something a bit close to what's on the right with those things moving. And I say a bit close to you because the most fascinating thing is this is completely dependent on your physiology. You cannot control it. Most importantly, I have no idea what you see. It's impossible for me to know. So this fight, um, it's a VR piece that uses based on this phenomena. It's an installation like this. I wanted it to be quite homely and welcoming, but with a slight twist of eerie miscomfort. Um, and hopefully you'll know when you walk in that you're about to go on some kind of spiritual journey. So it's a 10 minute linear experience. Here, 
the left eye sees the panel on the left, the right eye sees the panel on the right. Obviously, you're not getting the experience here at all because you need to have it to each eye to get that experience. But like I said, the fascinating thing for me is everyone sees the same thing, but I have no idea what they actually see consciously in their mind, which is, of course, how everything is always all the time, but we forget that. So I just wanted to remind that. Another fascinating thing is there are different scenes, whereas, for example, here, wherever you look, deforms. So this is the idea that seeing is an active process. The act of looking is the act of constructing the world that you're building in your mind. But furthermore, there's no rivalry to begin with. And when there's no rivalry, I'll just rewind a second, when there's no rivalry, it looks like you're in a room. There's, the vision is happening outside of your body. That's what it feels like, just like you are all outside there. That's how it appears to me. But when rivalry happens and the brain is unable to stitch the two images together, the image jumps from being out here, so it feels like it's physically located here, which of course is how vision is all the time, but we tend to forget that. And the reason I use this image, this is from a paper. I, I read a ton of papers when I was doing this. And Olivia Carter, she's a major researcher in this field. Um, it scientifically studies this phenomena. She and her team found that Tibetan Buddhist monks, through meditation, can freeze what they see. Uh, they can control what signal gets elevated from the lower levels of the visual cortex to their conscious awareness. And that is, I think, mind-boggling. Um, I think I'm a bit low on time, so I'm going to skip this. I'll just say one thing on it. No, I'll skip it, because it's text-based, and the translator will hate me anyway. Um, so, OK, I'll, I'll end on this. So I've spoken about. Um, a lot of the topics I said I would very briefly touched upon them about you know real-time interactivity, continuous control, I touched upon using machines that learn as a way to reflect on how we make sense of the world, how we project meaning, machine bias, human bias, cognitive bias, that as a driver of social political polarization. So this final chapter um, is going to be on computation as a language to supplement natural language as an attempt to express ideas more accurately in particular ways. And I'll give just one example that's probably the closest to my heart. So this is showing an artificial neural network that's training on a well-known data set of hundreds of thousands of faces, uh, celebrities. So every face that you see is fictional. It's dreamt up by the neural network while it's training. So first of all, the politics of this data set, who's in it, who's not in it, how it was collected, what it's for, is itself a critical topic, which I'm not going to get into right now. I want to talk about something related but different, and that is when I first started seeing these results, I was really fascinated by how everything was so smoothed out and so um, kind of perfect. And even though the original data set has quite some diversity, maybe not enough, but it has a diversity, in these images, it doesn't even have that level of diversity. It's completely lost variety in shape, characteristics, there's no blemishes, everything is normalized, averaged. And this is not behavior that I programmed in, like you know, some people do that as part of the practice. This is just an emergent property of this learning algorithm. It's basically learning not the data, but an idealized sense of hyperreal beauty like a race of perfect homogeneous specimens. So that's why I call this project Optimizing for Beauty. And this blurriness is a well-known problem of generative neural networks. I should say that this is not state-of-the-art. Uh, the algorithm that I showed at the beginning of my presentation, that is state-of-the-art. This is from about 2014. But the method that I'm using is still insanely widespread in all of statistics. Um, and, and it's a good method, I'll give it that. It's known as the maximum likelihood estimation. And that means, quite intuitively speaking, given some kind of data, find the hypothesis that is most likely to give rise to that data. 
So that kind of makes sense, but let me quickly demonstrate how it's problematic. Let's say we find a coin on a street, and we'd like to know whether it's a fair coin or whether it's biased. So we flip the coin 10 times and we get seven heads. Now the maximum likelihood estimation will say, okay, the most likely explanation that we would get seven heads is if this coin is weighted 70% towards heads. And that is correct. But that doesn't mean that that coin is actually weighted in that manner. It could still be a fair coin, it's just lower probability. I mean, the math works out, if it's weighted that way, it's 26% probability of getting seven heads. If it's a fair coin, it's 11%. It's still completely plausible. It might even be weighted towards tails. And it's very unlikely that we get seven heads, but it's still not an impossibility. So some of you might say, well, that's ridiculous. You're only 10 throws is nowhere near enough to do a maximum likelihood estimation, which is true, you'd be crazy to do that. Let's throw it a thousand times. Let's throw it a million times. But even if you throw it a million times and you get 700,000 heads, that doesn't guarantee that that coin is actually weighted in that way. Because evidence is not proof, it's just evidence. It's a set of observations that increase or decrease the likelihood of our confidence in a particular hypothesis. And the maximum likelihood approach is unable to deal with uncertainty. It's unable to deal with the possibility that a less likely, a less common hypothesis might actually be the correct one. So the maximum likelihood approach is binary. It has no room for alternatives. The hypothesis with the highest likelihood is the one that dominates and is assumed to be unequivocally true. Everything else is blurred and erased from this binary worldview. An alternative might be, for example, what's known as Bayesian logic, is that you maintain a distribution of beliefs. If you get seven heads out of 10, you say, okay, it's most likely that it's this, but it could be sick, it could be weighted this way, that's less likely. It could be weighted all against tails, but it would be very unlikely, but it's still a possibility. So you maintain a belief, a distribution of beliefs over hypotheses. And most critically, at every step of your decision-making process, you don't assume one hypothesis to be true. You act using the entire distribution and any data, new data that you receive, you just update your beliefs. Now, like I said, I don't really care about algorithms. To me, this is just a language, it's just a metaphor for how we are treating the way we make meaning and find truth in the world especially what I've been seeing, like I said, in my home country, with the current guy we have in power in England, with Brexit, and what seems to me an increasing amount of binary worldview where we are unable to hold alternate hypotheses in our own head, within our social groups particularly, and if we're not able to do that, we're unable to find points of departure where we might be disagreeing with each other because it's important to I think parse these multiple views and consider the possibility that there might be lines of reasoning leading to conclusions that we disagree with. We might even disagree with those lines of reasoning but if we do not accept that we will be unable to have these conversations and I believe it will be more damaging in the long run. So I'm going to end my presentation there. Thank you for your time and listening. And I'm gonna leave this kind of new work in progress up. I call it Deep Meditations. Um, and I'll be taking questions uh, while this plays in the background. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. У нас есть какое-то время на вопросы. Около 15 минут. Вопросы задавайте на русском. Пожалуйста. А... А, спасибо, очень интересный рассказ. А, мне очень понравились картинки, где, ну, наверное, люди могли бы увидеть там облака или а, огонь, а потом вот так неожиданно переключились на политический вопрос в конце, о том, что мы иногда видим а, мир черным или белым. Скажите, пожалуйста, есть ли примеры, как можно, как 
при помощи компьютеров можно сымитировать поведенческие, поведенческие особенности людей или животных. Спасибо. Sorry, do you mean how how can we use um, computers to mimic us, or how can we mimic it? I wasn't. How can we get computers to mimic us? Okay. Um, I mean that's a difficult question, really. It depends. Do you even want to do that? Um, which I can understand why you might want to. Um, I'm thinking of like the Feynman quote, what I cannot create, I cannot understand. My personal interest is totally about augmenting humans, um, particularly augmenting human ability to creatively express themselves. So like that piece that you mentioned, yeah, that's clearly an attempt at alternative interfaces to animation, filmmaking, storytelling. The idea of replicating humans or animals is not where my research is. I find it fascinating. I do read a lot about it. I can say one of the biggest, most fascinating challenges, well, I find most fascinating challenges right now in that realm is so-called unsupervised learning or to be more specific, intrinsic motivation, which is the idea that everything that I showed, the way it works is I collect data, I design an algorithm, and then I give the algorithm an objective. I say, this is your task. You have to make sure that that data maps to that data, and this is your loss function. This is the metric by which you compare. What intrinsic motivation is, is you don't define any of that. You just define one general purpose function that allows this agent to explore the world Find the right balance between so-called exploration and exploitation, because you don't want to do too much of either, in a way that maximizes some kind of reward, which we don't define. And this is a big area of research. And generally, the angles are one of curiosity, so you get a lot of research into curiosity-driven agents. Another one is kind of like maximizing the um, entropy, or like the, the amount of information that be can be gained from an action that you take that the, reward, um, the amount of information that you get back from that. So I would say that intrinsic motivation is what I think is the most fascinating um, area in trying to look at what we do versus what machines do. I don't know if that answers your question. Вопрос вот соседний. Да. Здравствуйте. Вы много говорили сегодня про возможности искусственного интеллекта, про то, как он развивается. И естественно, что он на скором времени превзойдет. И вот как вы думаете, как будет объединение человека и искусственного интеллекта? Как человек будет взаимодействовать с искусственным интеллектом, вот даже в вашей художественной сфере? Как будут происходить вот эти вот а, нюанс, нюансы, наладки, да, а, мысли мозга и а, искусственного интеллекта? Спасибо. So the idea of AI overtaking humans um, is already happening, obviously. Like uh, on so, I mean, even you know, just a simple Google search is is a superhuman uh, capacity. Like we we can't do that. And if obviously if you think of things like Go or chess or like these classic examples. So computers have already overtaken us, you know, in these so-called narrow fields. The idea of, I don't subscribe to the idea of uh, AGI, uh, art artificial general intelligence, or the idea of general superhuman intelligence, or the intelligence explosion, um, th that aspect of the singularity. I, I don't subscribe to that. The singularity is happening already, but from a different perspective in the sense that the essence of the singularity is that it's a point at which we cannot see beyond. And that is already happening and it's going to happen. Like I said, once or if we solve uh, genotype to phenotype mapping, then humanity will not be the same. So I think the question of how will AI affect humanity goes beyond how do we interface with the algorithm directly, but its broader impact. 
Because while we're thinking about that, maybe someone's going to come and say, yeah, I can now make humans with 300 IQ. Um, and everything else that we've been thinking about is just goes down the drain. So it's the unknown unknowns, I think, which are the most kind of fascinating or horrifying. I say fascinating because, for example, the fascinating perspective is what if we could genetically modify ourselves to photosynthesize? Um, now, that probably sounds ridiculous to most people, but I think telling people from 100 years ago that we would one day land a robot on Mars also sounded quite ridiculous. And maybe we can't photosynthesize, but I'm pretty sure that things are going to happen that we, the most imaginative of us, just cannot even begin to comprehend. So that's really where I uh, position myself on that. How, what the future will be is unimaginable. Yeah. Спасибо. Вопросы? Спасибо вам большое. У меня такой простой достаточно вопрос. Какие инструменты вы используете? для создания программ, которые вы нам продемонстрировали, и где вы делаете эти невероятные вещи? Yeah, thanks. Um, so, all of the early work that I showed prior to machine learning in the, in the beginning, I use, I use a lot of, op I use open source stuff, basically, for, for everything, and that was all using a framework called Open Frameworks, it's C++. Since I started working with machine learning, I use Python, because that's the kind of language that's the most popular. And I've been using TensorFlow, which is Google's library for deep learning. And I've been using PyTorch, which is, it's kind of not officially Facebook's, but they're really backing it quite, quite heavily right now. So I use those. It's a very um, interestingly open research. So that's quite good, like unlike other disciplines maybe. A lot of code is open and shared. Um, and I think that's because the big companies, they require that there's not enough people to hire. Like I've had these conversations with people at Google and Facebook. There isn't enough people in the world for them to hire. They want to hire more. So they're releasing everything because they want people to get up to speed. Because they also know that without the data, the algorithms are actually not that useful and they own the data. So they release everything, and what, not everything, but a lot of stuff is open source, which does make it easier for us to just get our hands dirty. Um, if you're interested, I would say check out Gene Kogan's Machine Learning for Artists set of workshops and writings and books. It's a really, really good introduction to um, basically machine learning, ML4A, it's called, and yeah, that's it. Был соседний вопрос, да. Hey, thank you. Um, у меня вопрос есть. Uh, вы верите, что вот все то, что вы показали в машинное обучение, нейронные сети, помогает um, описать или объяснить природу человека? То есть вы показывали пример, как um, нейросеть учится видеть. Или как мы составляем, как мы глазами видим этот мир. Верите вы, что это помогает нам понять вот, наше, ну, не знаю, как это сказать, существо, бытие, okay? Или yeah. это просто очередная попытка описать мир, и она вообще неправда, и все на самом деле по-другому? So. Yeah, I, I think your question is really the essence of my presentation, in that everything is us trying to project what we think onto it. Um, to, to quote George Box, all models are wrong. The, the question is, some are more wrong than others. And at what point, how wrong, I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember the exact quote, so I'm kind of butchering it here. But um, the, the premise of what he said was, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And the question is, how wrong does it need to be to stop being useful? And then going back to your question about do I believe, I, I want to tie into my last segment on belief 
I don't believe anything as uh, true or false. Rather, I have distributions of beliefs. So my distribution of belief over what you asked about is that accurate is, it's just a metaphor. Because um, like everything that we do in my mind is just metaphors. We, we can only understand the world through things that we already know. We try to relate it. So for me, a lot of these methods are my attempts at finding alternative ways of looking at certain things in the hope that it might shed some light. With the particular piece you're talking about, the learning, I didn't show some bits, but there's some very fascinating things that happen, which is if you inject noise into the system, into the network, um, not at the image level, but into the depths of the network, what ends up happening is it reconstructs images but that are not exactly the same as what it's seeing now, but has fragments of what it saw before that's a reminiscence of what it's seeing right now. So if I stand here for ages and the camera looks at me, it reconstructs me, and I walk away, and then it constructs the background, and then if you walk in front of it, you kind of have my form, so it will recall me, and then it will slowly realize that, oh, this is not me, and it'll start learning about you. So to me, these are just metaphors, they're not models. But then, again, going back to all models are wrong, you know, F equals MA, that's a model, it's not correct. Like, we know that to be not correct, you know, Einstein showed it's not correct, but it, it's an accurate model, you know, we can send... Um, you know, rockets into space based on that model. So the question is, like I said, how correct um, is the model? I, I have no idea. It's just a metaphor for me. Вопрос вон там. Вот сзади вас. Здравствуйте. Uh, спасибо большое за очень интересную лекцию. Uh, вы говорили о том, что большие данные предвосхитили появление искусственного интеллекта. Возможно ли, что в будущем количество данных будет так велико, что каждому человеку будет необходимо, необходим постоянный контакт с искусственным интеллектом, для ориентации в огромных потоках данных. Yeah, that's also a good question. Uh, we're definitely moving in that direction, not because it's inevitable, but because you know we're being steered in that direction with you know Google. I don't know what Google is. Uh, Google Now, Siri, Alexa, Google Home. Um, you know all those things. That's definitely the direction that we're being pushed in. And. I don't know what it will do to our cognitive facilities. I have no idea. Already, like I read some interesting studies of how kids today who are growing up you know, with these phones are so different to how we grew up and how they treat their memory, where they just don't see the point in memorizing or learning important things. Like I have a friend who's a teacher, and she was saying kids don't just want to, they don't want to learn dates. Like why would they memorize a date? Why waste neural? space for that when you can just look it on Wikipedia. So I'm fascinated to think about what impact this will have on us, but definitely the trajectory that we're on is in that direction. And the aim is with like these assistants that you don't need to um, think of anything, that the device will be somehow smart enough to know that you want information about where to get a taxi because you need to catch a plane, so you probably want to book it, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, that's that. Последний вопрос. Спасибо большое за презентацию. У меня вопрос в механике обработки изображений. Это все происходит на уровне обработки, анализа именно графических изображений или были успешные эксперименты со смыслом? Потому что нейронные сети применялись в анализе текста, в анализе смысла текста, в анализе текст, э, смыслов слов. А можно ли их как-то связать? И были, были ли успешные эксперименты, когда компьютер мог э, изображение описать в понятный текст для человека и потом, наоборот, выстроить какое-то изображение по тексту? Спасибо. I mean, actually, the, the project that I skipped was a, a, exactly that. As in, it was a text-based model. 
you're totally right. There are models um, or architectures that are able to uh, learn some kind of meaning. But really what I mean by meaning is learn semantic relationships. Um, so the model that I was using here is, they're called word embedding models, and you basically give it a huge corpus of text, and it doesn't know anything. It doesn't know English. It doesn't know what a word is. It, it doesn't know what a verb is. You give it a huge corpus of text, in this case, 100 billion words of news articles, and it scrapes through that, and it learns to associate words and find directions, meanings in a high-dimensional geometric space such that you can um, quite famously do mathematical operations on these, like queen minus king plus man, it learns about gender, and it will say queen. Um, it learns about tense, swam, swimming, walking, etc. So I was curious, you know, what else has it learned? Because it learns from the internet, and God knows what's on the internet. Um, and again, I, I skipped all of this, but the interesting thing for me here was, the blurriness between the machine's bias and what the machine has learned versus when we look at these results, what do we project back on? Like if I read human minus God, this is what you ask the network and it says animal. Like that sounds quite profound to me, I don't know. Um, love without sex is adoring. But anyway, so to go back to the second part of your question, yes, you can combine this with images, and people do do that. It's, um, I wouldn't say trivial, but it's relatively um, a, a known procedure, like multimodal models, they're called, whereby the idea is, and the way this works is, at one end of the network, the input, you have words. And in the middle, you have this thing called the latent space, which is at the, at the heart of all of these things. And that space means nothing to us. It's a high dimensional space, which is just a semantic space. And what you can do is you can use these spaces to map between different modes. Like you can encode a sentence into this space, and then it becomes a representation, not of words, but of just pure meaning. And that's how you can do translation. You can map an English sentence into that space, and then decode into French. But you can also do it with images. You can map a sentence into that space and then have a decoder which is trained on images because that space is agnostic of mode. It's just about meaning. Um, so this is kind of like the frontiers right now. And it is very, very interesting to see the work that's being done in that field. Thank you so much, Mimo. It was extremely inspiring. So. Well, thank you all. Awesome.